Welcome to the Watchman Channel. This channel is all about world news and Bible prophecy, pointing to the soon return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I am asking that if you can, to please help to financially support this ministry. If you feel led to pledge any amount of money, it would be extremely helpful and greatly appreciated. There is a PayPal link in the description box and in my pinned comment below. You can also donate using Cash App. My cash tag is dollar sign watchman 1963 thank you all so much for your prayers and support god bless jesus said as a sign of his coming and the end of the age christians would be persecuted as we read in matthew 24 9 and luke 21 12. matthew 24 9 then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake luke 21 12 but before all these things they will lay their hands on you and persecute you delivering you up to the synagogues and prisons. You will be brought before kings and rulers for my name's sake. John 15, 18-20 If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. On Wednesday, the International Christian Concern Organization released its 2023 Persecutors of the Year report. It highlights the top 10 worst countries for Christian persecution. And our next guest says the issue is so underreported by the media that the average person doesn't even know it's happening. ICC President Jeff King joins us now. Jeff, thank you for this important work for raising the awareness on this. You're right. Most Christians are mostly unaware of the level of persecution around the world. Where are we with Christian persecution right now in 2023? Well, I would say it's it's persistent, it's pervasive, it's proliferating, it's it's growing. Um, and you know, just as an example, you, you I would say look to Nigeria. You know, hardly anybody knows Nigeria in the last 20 years, probably upwards of a hundred thousand Christians have been killed. Three and a half million Christian 000. farmers lost their lands. And this is at the hands of radical Islam. And that's that's a lot of the story that's going on around the world that the press uh, generally doesn't report. Radical Islam, but we're also seeing, also seeing you know, countries like China, uh, where I, talk to me about the status of the underground church in in uh, in countries like Iran and China. Well, that's that's probably the most exciting thing. One of the things I, I most like to talk about that. So often, persecution breeds growth in the church. Hmm. Uh, and the church in China, the church in Iran are exploding, especially in Iran. It's the fastest growing church in the world. Uh, and that's in spite of, you know, 40 years of absolute terror, of repression, murder of the pastors and the Christians as a whole. It's an amazing story. The fastest growing church in the world is in Iran? That, that is true. And here's the other thing is that mosques are fairly empty, except for the old. The mosques are empty. Uh, Christianity has exploded. And that's all because of radical Islam and what they've done for decades. Interesting. What can Christians do to support those persecuted? We're so fortunate to live in a country with the free exercise of religion, yet so many Christians don't have that. How can Christians help? Yeah, well, first of all, go to persecution.org and then follow follow the subject matter, get, the, get a magazine that's free, uh, so you know what's going on. And at persecution.org, we every day we're posting news about what's going on uh, in that world. So that's the first thing. And then call legislators. You know, we put out alerts when countries are doing terrible things and we ask uh, our leaders to call and make back channel calls and that can make a world of difference and then of course as christians we're always going to pray but sometimes we have to turn over the tables and i uh, that's one of the biggest things you know start shouting in, in nigeria to go back to your first example the government there is hunting for pastors or for anybody who's openly a christian well this is this is a a, a group of it's a tribal group but the main one is Fulanis. everyone's also heard of boko haram but the big problem is the Fulanis, and that's a tribe but it's it's too complex to talk about this or that. Really, the simple story is this is radical Islam. These guys are Islamists. They're driving out the Christians. It's a massive genocide, a massive land grab. Again, hardly anybody knows or talks about it. John 16, 1 through 3. These things I have spoken to you, that you should not be made to stumble. They will put you out of the synagogues. Yes, the time is coming that whoever kills you will think that he offers God service. And these things they will do to you because they have not known the Father nor me. Service is the Greek word latria, which means ministration of God, i.e. worship. 
Muslims kill in the name of Allah, thinking they offer God worship. The Bible tells us they do it because they do not know the Father nor His Son, Jesus Christ. The Christian persecution the church is suffering right now, awful as it is, will only get worse. The Bible tells us in the last days, right before Jesus returns, the greatest political leader in the history of mankind will take the world stage. He will launch a military campaign that will result in his acquiring authority over all peoples of the earth as we read in Revelation 13, 7 and 8. It was granted to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them, and authority was given him over every tribe, tongue, and nation. All who dwell on the earth will worship him, whose names have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. His empire will be the most extensive in all of history, encompassing the entire world, and his rule will be the most demonic the world has ever experienced. He will appear to be the savior of the world, but as he consolidates his power, his true nature will be revealed. He will emerge as a Satan-possessed and empowered person who hates God and is determined to annihilate Christianity. His method of eliminating Christians will be by beheading as we read in Revelation 24. And I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast or his image, and had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands. For this reason, he is identified in scripture as the Antichrist as we read in 1 John 2.18. Little children, it is the last hour, and as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come, by which we know that it is the last hour. Jesus said, as a sign of his coming and the end of the age, there would be an increase in deception, false Christ who will deceive many, wars and rumors of wars, nation against nation and kingdom against kingdom, famines, pestilences, earthquakes, Christian persecution, apostasy, false prophets, and lawlessness causing the love of many to grow cold. Jesus said all of these signs would come like birth pains. Jesus was likening last day's events to a woman in labor. As the labor progresses, the pains increase in both frequency and intensity until the baby finally comes. As we get closer to Jesus' return, all the signs he gave us as a sign of his coming and the end of the age will become more frequent and more intense. All of these signs are manifesting around the world in our time. After wreaking havoc in other parts of Western Europe on Thursday, Storm Chiron is now bearing down on Tuscany in central Italy. At least three people have been killed as torrential rainfall caused rivers to break their banks and swamped the streets of several villages. The regional governor has declared a state of emergency. In the Spanish capital Madrid, powerful wind gusts have brought down trees. One of them killed a 23-year-old woman and injured three others. The storm has disrupted rail services and caused the cancellation of flights across Europe. Strong winds have also been recorded in Belgium. Two people, including a five-year-old child, died after they were struck by flying tree branches. Wind gusts of more than 160 kilometres per hour have torn roofs from homes on the English island of Jersey. People have been taken to emergency accommodation. British authorities are reporting widespread flooding and damage across the UK. More than 80 flood warnings are still in place. The storm has also damaged the power grid in northwestern France. Work to restore electricity to more than one million homes is continuing. The severe weather in France has killed at least two people, including a truck driver. Almost half of Europe is still reeling from Storm Kirin, which killed at least 12 people, caused millions of euros worth of damage, and left half a million homes in France without electricity. The storm caused hurricane force winds to fan a forest fire in Spain and broke records in the United Kingdom. Half a dozen countries were on alert for two days, and hundreds of flights were grounded. Tuscany in central Italy was the most affected by the storm, which killed at least seven people. One person is still missing after heavy rains hit the region. Around 300 had to be evacuated and in some areas, a month's worth of rain fell in just three hours. As we look at the news, there is no doubt we are in the birth pains Jesus spoke of in Matthew 24, 8. We see many of God's remedial judgments manifesting as if God is warning us of things to come and calling on people to repent. We see war and rumors of wars, famine and pestilence resulting in the deaths of thousands around the world. We are seeing earthquakes, extreme heat, floods, wildfires, tornadoes, hailstorms and hurricanes, all at record levels of frequency 
and intensity, just like Jesus said would happen just prior to his return. The judgments God will use to punish mankind with during the seven-year tribulation will be much worse than any of us can imagine. Still, this is God's grace and mercy, proving to everyone that these judgments come from him, and he is still offering forgiveness of sins through his only begotten Son, Jesus Christ. If you have not accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I implore you to do so today as we are not guaranteed tomorrow. More than 600 people have been evacuated from their homes in Valencia, Spain, after an out-of-control fire burnt through some 1,400 hectares of forest. A sleepless night for firefighters as the inferno affected several villages and towns, including the municipality of La Valle del Baida, where at least one house burst down. The flames even reached the border of the province of Alicante. According to local authorities, the fire started with a small outbreak, but the strong winds in the region caused it to spread rapidly. An earthquake in a remote area of Nepal has killed at least 157 people. The 5.6 magnitude quake hit just before midnight Friday when many people were sleeping. It collapsed buildings and triggered landslides in a region where many villages can only be reached by foot. Officials say the death toll will likely go higher. A magnitude 6.4 earthquake shook western Nepal on Friday. The tremors were felt in the capital Kathmandu and as far away as New Delhi. The districts of Jajarkot and Rukum West in the remote Karnali province were hardest hit. Many people spent the night outside in the cold. I was asleep when I suddenly felt the shaking. I got up and tried to run, but was caught in the collapsing debris. The Prime Minister and several MPs flew in to assess the damage and offer their condolences to affected communities. They were accompanied by medical teams from the army. Our primary focus is to rescue the injured, provide treatment and distribute relief materials. All the teams are working hard. As local hospitals struggle to treat the injured, health personnel from other parts of the country have been deployed as reinforcements. Dozens of severely injured have been airlifted to bigger hospitals in nearby towns. Nepal is among the most vulnerable countries to earthquakes as the tectonic plates beneath its young mountains continue to shift in their formation. Earthquakes are increasingly being felt across the country. The fighting raging in Gaza overnight, despite calls for a ceasefire or even a humanitarian pause. Yes, the world watching and reacting in Washington. Thousands of pro-Palestinian protesters filled the streets in the largest demonstration of its kind in the U.S. since Israel began its strikes on Gaza in response to the Hamas terrorist attack on October 7th. And in a surprise visit, Secretary of State Blinken meeting with Palestinian Authority President Mahmoud Abbas in the Israeli-occupied West Bank, discussing the efforts to restore calm and stability to the area. And this morning, we are getting a close-up look at the Israeli Defense Forces in the war zone, the IDF taking our Ian panel into Gaza. Ian is now back in Tel Aviv, and that's where we begin right now. This was a rare, short, and quite intense opportunity to see what the situation is like in Gaza on the ground. We've been reporting from outside Gaza, although we're getting images from inside. Neither the Egyptian government nor the Israelis today will allow foreign journalists in. But this was a chance to travel with the Israeli Defense Forces inside to see it for ourselves. Obviously, our view was limited. There are places that we couldn't go. And the Israeli Defense Forces checked our footage for operational security. This morning, for the first time since this war began, we go into Gaza. Embedded with troops from Israel's 401st Armored Brigade for a few hours. The first time they've taken journalists into the war zone since it began. Well, we're just on the Israeli side of the border with Gaza. We're together with a tank regiment. They've got tanks, they've got armored personnel carriers. Uh, and they're going to take us basically down this track, which leads straight into Gaza. I asked the commander, what is the situation on the ground? His answer was very simply, nowhere is safe there. The convoy starts to move. The doors of our heavily armored vehicle lock tight and a tense, high-risk journey begins. Lieutenant Colonel Ido Ben Anat is the deputy commander of the 401. How tough has the fighting been? It's tough. It's tough. Uh, they're trying to surprise us. They're trying to see where we're, we're strong, where we're weak, and how they can take it as an advantage. We were driven about three miles into the Gaza Strip towards the northern side of Gaza City. 
It's a scene of utter devastation. Building after building scarred and blackened by the bombardment. The crackle of gunfire and crump of tank fire ever present. The landscape is apocalyptic. We're here in Gaza at the moment. We're here together with the Israeli Defence Forces. We're not allowed to say exactly where we are. You can see the tanks next to me. You can hear the sound of the tank fire. We're hearing gunfire. It still remains an incredibly active zone. But this is what we weren't able to see. Israel's relentless assault on Gaza. The night sky turned orange from shelling. Buildings in flames at the Jabalia refugee camp hit by another airstrike. All hands on deck to rescue the survivors. It's been nearly a month into this war. More than 9,000 people have been killed in Gaza, according to the Hamas-run health ministry, and Israeli officials reporting over 1,400 deaths. Inside Gaza, the health system beyond capacity. It is a full of patients. No, any vacant place to admit to inpatient department, as you see. Still, always, it is the same scene. Medical staff are overwhelmed and facilities overrun. Doctors at Al Shifa Hospital work by flashlight without electricity or fuel to keep the lights on. The UN saying nearly half of hospitals in Gaza are no longer functioning. And the militant group Hamas releasing this video, they say shows fighting with Israeli forces in the northwest of Gaza, although ABC News can't confirm exactly when this was filmed. But the administration's calling for a humanitarian pause in the fighting to get aid into Gaza, to prevent more mass casualties, and to try to help get the roughly 240 hostages out. Mr. President, any progress on the humanitarian pause? Yes. Well, incredibly, despite the presence of Israeli troops on the ground, despite all the bombing and all the movements of land troops, Hamas is still able to try and launch rockets here into Israel. Late last night, as we were going into bed, we could hear the sound of multiple rockets being intercepted by Israel's Iron Dome system. But Israeli forces absolutely adamant that they've started a war that they're not going to stop until they achieve victory. What struck you the most about your journey into Gaza? I mean, we... So they took two reporter groups in. One went about a mile or so, and we went a bit further, around three miles or so. But, but you realise that the level of destruction uh, and how difficult it's been just to travel that short distance. And I've seen this before in previous conflicts, especially Mosul in Iraq against the Islamic State. It makes you realise how tough the battle is, how tough the terrain is. And even though every single building is smashed, you realise that Hamas still has the capability to move through tunnels underground and pop up behind Israeli forces. But we could see Gaza City from uh, the outside. You could see the heavy destruction there. But it makes you realise, and I spoke to the uh, deputy commander there, I said, look, how long do you think this is going to go on for? And he said, well, put it this way, my daughter's birthday is in January, and hopefully I'll be back in time to share it with her. The U.S. is facing increased pressure to push Israel to address the worsening humanitarian crisis in Gaza. Today, Secretary of State Antony Blinken met with Arab diplomats in Jordan to hear demands for a ceasefire in Gaza. It comes a day after more than 600 U.S. aid employees signed a letter urging President Biden to call for an immediate ceasefire and cessation of hostilities, according to The Washington Post. Christina Ruffini has more from the White House. Christina, good morning. Good morning, Jeff. Well, the Biden administration says it won't call for a ceasefire because Israel has a right to defend itself. But Secretary of State Blinken is trying to convince Israeli leaders to settle for a semantic substitute, a humanitarian pause to help civilians caught in the crossfire. We provided Israel advice that only the best of friends can offer on how to minimize civilian deaths. On his third visit to Israel since the start of the conflict, Secretary of State Anthony Blinken argued that a break would have both humanitarian and strategic benefits. We see it uh, as a way also, uh, and, and, and very importantly, of uh, creating a better um, uh, environment in which hostages uh, can be uh, released. But in remarks after their meeting, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu said Israel would not consider any kind of ceasefire until Hamas frees all the remaining hostages. Diplomats, including Blinken, try to keep this two-party conflict from escalating into a larger regional war. We need to continue to prevent escalation of this conflict. It's spread to other areas. Yesterday, the leader of the Iran-backed terrorist group Hezbollah, located in Lebanon, threatened to escalate its attacks on Israel. And there is fear that Iranian proxies from Iraq to Syria could be waiting in the wings. As a sign of his coming and the end of the age, Jesus declares, and you will hear of wars and rumors of wars, see that you are not troubled, 
for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. The prophets of the Old Testament prophesied of these future military conflicts in Isaiah 17.1, in which Damascus, Syria will be destroyed in a single night. Jeremiah 49, the prophecy of Alam, which could infer an Israeli attack upon Iran's nuclear program. Psalm 83, in which the Muslim nations that border Israel will mount an attack on Israel in order to cut them off from being a nation. Ezekiel 38 and 39, known as the War of Gog and Magog. In this prophecy, a coalition of nations led by Russia, Iran, and Turkey will attack Israel in the last days in order to take Israel's wealth. So the USS Eisenhower has passed through the Suez Canal and entered the Red Sea. And Secretary of State Antony Blinken heard calls for a ceasefire from Arab leaders in Jordan today. Fox News Chief National Security Correspondent Jennifer Griffin joins us from the Pentagon with the latest on America's role in the war in Israel. Secretary of State Blinken was in Jordan today where he met with Arab allies. He thanked the government of Qatar for trying to help negotiate the release of the hostages, including Americans being held right now in Gaza. As you mentioned, the USS Eisenhower Aircraft Carrier Strike Group has transited the Suez Canal and entered the Red Sea, according to the U.S. Navy's Fifth Fleet. For the past three days, the Eisenhower joined the USS Ford, the Navy's most modern modern state-of-the-art aircraft carrier for military exercises in the eastern Mediterranean to send a clear message again to Hezbollah and Iran that they are prepared to strike if any U.S. interests are harmed. On October 7, 2023, Hamas initiated what many have described as Israel's 9-11, unleashing forces that could destabilize the entire Middle East and pull the U.S. into more conflict. We've just learned, John, that uh, the U.S. bases in Iraq and Syria have experienced experienced a total now of 31 attempted attacks on those bases, mostly rockets and drones. We learned about one, uh, a one-way drone that nearly uh, hit the al-Shaddadi base in northeast Syria. It did not. It did not cause any harm or infrastructure damage. In fact, it was starting in October 17th that these, uh, these attacks on U.S. bases by Iranian proxies began. It was in those first days that there were some concussions and head injuries, uh, TBI, for some U.S. troops, but there haven't been any uh, injuries since then, I'm told. Thousands of pro-Palestinian protesters raging in D.C. before descending on the White House, chanting, Allah Akbar while cursing President Biden and Israel. Fox News correspondent Griff Jenkins was there, and he joins us now. Griff. Hey, Will, good morning. And, you know, you would think tens of thousands of turnout demanding a ceasefire in Gaza would make the cover of The Washington Post, but interestingly, it doesn't. The lead story is about climate change in South Sudan, and it perhaps isn't there because their other main message is to turn out in front of the White House, as they did to accuse President Biden of genocide for supporting Israel. And by the way, the crowd didn't want to talk about the events on October 7th. Take a look. Genocide Joe needs to halt his actions immediately and realize that he's going to face massive opposition from Democrat voters next election. Is Biden a terrorist? He is. His hands are red with blood. They're soaked in blood, the blood of the children, the innocent children of Palestine. This is not Israel. This is Palestine. This is our ancestral homeland. Do you support uh, Israel to exist, or are you saying get rid of Israel altogether? Get rid of it. Israel is terrorists. They kill the children. They, they, they bomb the hospital. They do a lot of things bad in Gaza. You see, the, you see Israel as terrorists? Yes. What's the flag? What's the message out here? Uh, well, queer liberation, Palestinian liberation, liberation for everybody. And, uh, and so what about the, the LGBTQ rights not being respected in places like Gaza? Well, people keep bringing that up. Do you condemn Hamas or do you support their efforts? Do you condemn 75 years of occupation? That's the answer. Should Israel exist? There is no Israel. Israel is a fascist state. Yeah, and I'm anti-fascist. You're going to breed Hamas 
when you continue to keep occupying the people. Hamas will be everywhere when you continue to keep occupying the people. That's it. The U.S. points to Hamas in Gaza and say they're terrorists. Do you agree? That's unacceptable. And Will, it's quite clear that while the president was in Rehoboth Beach, the message has got to have been heard out there because this is now going to be an issue that he's going to have to deal with. And I don't think there's any good answers for the White House right now. You know, Griff, I'm struck by the anger that you encountered. I mean, there, there was a lot of uh, not just uh, political statements, but very, very emotional reactions to some of your, your questions. I'm curious about the one guy that you asked, um, do you think there should be an Israel? And he said, no, but he was holding a sign that said, keep the world clean. And clean was written almost like in the Palestinian flag. What, do, you, do you remember that poster? you remember what he meant by that? That young uh, man was with his mother, and she actually tried to say, well, you know, it's more complicated than that. He doesn't really understand that. But I think it's to your point, Will, that you had a lot of people out there that have been emotionally driven and maybe, in his, the young man's case, not fully aware of what it is that they're saying. That entire march was essentially about the eliminationism of Israel. I mean, mm. if you basically cloned the squad as we know them, AOC, Talib, Omar, and turned them into 30,000 versions of themselves calling for the uh, end of Israel. That's what you had out there. And so the emotions were driven towards one thing, and that was anti-Israel. But mm. of course, it also came with the caveat that they now hold Joe Biden responsible for supporting Israel. Do you support uh, Israel to exist, or are you saying get rid of Israel altogether? Get rid of it. Do you condemn Hamas, or do you support their efforts? Do you condemn 75 years of occupation? That's the answer. Should Israel exist? There is no Israel. This is not Israel. This is Palestine. This is our ancestral homeland. So who does the land of Israel actually belong to? Israel was given to the Jews forever, and God first made that promise to Abraham, as we read in Genesis 13, 14 through 17. And the Lord said to Abram, after Lot had separated from him, Lift your eyes now and look from the place where you are, northward, southward, eastward, and westward. For all the land which you see I give to you and your descendants forever, and I will make your descendants as the dust of the earth, so that if a man could number the dust of the earth, then your descendants also could be numbered. Arise, walk in the land through its length and its width, for I give it to you. The promise was then confirmed to his son Isaac, as we read in Genesis 26.3. Dwell in this land, and I will be with you and bless you. For to you and your descendants I give all these lands, and I will perform the oath which I swore to Abraham your father. The promise was then confirmed to Isaac's son Jacob, Abraham's grandson, as we read in Genesis 28.10-13. Now Jacob went out from Beersheba and went toward Haran. So he came to a certain place and stayed there all night, because the sun had set. And he took one of the stones of that place and put it at his head, and he lay down in that place to sleep. Then he dreamed, and behold, a ladder was set upon the earth, and its top reached to heaven. And there the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham your father, and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie, I will give to you and your descendants. The promised land was described in terms of the territory from the river of Egypt to the Euphrates River, as we read in Genesis 15:18. On the same day the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, To your descendants I have given this land, from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates. God then reaffirmed the promise when he changed Jacob's name to Israel, as we read in Genesis 35, 9-12. Then God appeared to Jacob again when he came from Padan Aram and blessed him. And God said to him, Your name is Jacob. Your name shall not be called Jacob any more, but Israel shall be your name. So he called his name Israel. Also God said to him, I am God Almighty. Be fruitful and multiply. A nation and a company of nations shall proceed from you, and kings shall come from your body. The land which I gave Abraham and Isaac I give to you, and to your descendants after you I give this land. As we can plainly see, God gave Israel to the Jews. We're back with a Fox News alert. You're looking live at the Gaza Strip as Israeli forces continue their ground push into Hamas strongholds. 
And Prime Minister Netanyahu says they don't plan on pressing pause anytime soon. Retired Air Force Brigadier General Rob Spaulding joins us now to react. Our Secretary of State's trying to push a pause. I don't know the difference between a pause or a ceasefire. Uh, Bibi Netanyahu says they will continue. What's your take on the situation right now? Well, I think any pause is going to lead to further Israeli deaths. Either it's going to lead to you know more troops getting killed during the invasion when they eventually do invade, or it's going to lead to more Israelis getting killed because Hamas thinks they can get away with it. So I don't think it, it benefits the civilians uh, in Gaza because Hamas really doesn't care about them anyway. I think they're just using the time to really get prepared to kill more Israelis. So, I mean, in your mind, as far as operational tempo is concerned, Israel's got to keep going, keep pressing on the ground if they want to maintain the momentum? Absolutely. And I think they need to take the offensive and they need to actually uh, rid Gaza of Hamas. And we should be supporting that. I don't think we should be advocating a pause at all. We wouldn't be pausing if this was us. Militarily, is the U.S. posture correct right now? Forget the statements about pauses, but as far as positioning of forces. Well, I, I think we've done all we can do. The problem, quite frankly, is that we've spent so many munitions in Ukraine. We are we're worn out. You know, our our military was already worn out from the two from the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq. Now Ukraine. Now this. We don't have the munitions. We are just basically flat broke in terms of, you know, our readiness in the military. So we've done what we can. Flat broke as it pertains to readiness in our military. I've heard the same thing, General. And it, it, when you get yourself overextended and out of ammo, that's a bad place to be. All right, we've probably all been so focused on what's going on in Israel with Hamas and the threat of the expanding war with Hezbollah to the north and what's happening with all of these of rebel groups in Syria, but has anyone been looking at what China has been doing? 43 planes, seven ships near Taiwan as we speak. Um, maybe they're seizing on, on, on the notion that maybe we're preoccupied or the world is. Gordon Chang uh, is probably the most re remarkable people to read China that I know of in my years doing this job. So what do you make of what they're doing? I mean, this is more than provocative behavior. This is something that's almost a daily occurrence. Yes, and it's not just Taiwan, Neil. Um, what we saw, for instance, at the end of October with regard to the Philippines in the South China Sea, Scarborough and Second Thomas Shoals got very close to war. Matter of fact, President Biden on October 25th actually had to speak from the podium at the White House and warn China that we were prepared to use force against Beijing uh, to do, uh, defend the Philippines. So it's gotten to be a very serious situation where China's been ignoring our warnings escalating all throughout East Asia, and that means that we are pretty close to conflict. Do you know anything as well, Gordon, about their, uh, their more of their ships are in the neighborhood uh, around the Middle East and particularly around the Mediterranean, on top of what we have with the USS Ronald Reagan and the USS Gerald R. Ford, uh, keeping somewhat of their distance, but they're, they're in the neighborhood. Yes, they are. And they did this in uh, 2013 at the height of the Syrian uh, civil war when they brought um, their most impressive looking ship at the time into the eastern Mediterranean as a warning to the United States and NATO not to intervene. And I think they're probably doing that again because they've got six vessels in the region. Um, and I think that's their playbook, especially because they're working very closely with Iran and working, of course, with Russia. So you have an axis that is challenging the United States across the board. We seem to be more focused for the time being on, on dealing with Israel, uh, holding off, you know, Iran. Um, but when it comes to Iran, I certainly know the Russian ties. What about the China ties? Well, in 2021, we had that 25-year, $400 billion comprehensive partnership agreement. Um, also, in February of this year, there were those 20 agreements that uh, China and uh, Tehran signed up uh, when the Iranian president went to Beijing. And, of course, uh, China's increased purchases of uh, Iran's oil, uh, which are subject to U.S. sanctions, by the way. But that's giving a critical lifeline. And, by the way, we are seeing North Korean weapons in the hands of Hamas fighters. We're seeing Chinese weapons in the hands of the Houthis. The Houthis are now fighting Israel. And also Hamas has some Chinese weapons, which probably are leftovers from a little while ago. But the point is that China is supporting the attack on Israel across um, many domains. It seems as though we are on the verge of World War III. Jesus told us in the last days there would be war between the nations. Are we seeing the stage setting taking place to fulfill this prophecy?
If so, then we're close to the time Jesus refers to as the worst time in the history of the world as we read in Matthew 24, 21. For then there will be great tribulation, such as has not been since the beginning of the world until this time, no, nor ever shall be. If we are that close to the tribulation, then the world is about to see war the likes of this planet has never seen before. The book of Revelation tells us when Jesus breaks the first seal, the Antichrist will be unleashed. When Jesus breaks the second seal, war will be unleashed. Resulting from these wars will be famine, pestilence, and death as Jesus breaks the third and fourth seals. The Bible tells us 25% of the population of the earth will be killed at this time, as we read in Revelation 6-8. So I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and the name of him who sat on it was Death, and Hades followed with him. And power was given to them over a fourth of the earth, to kill with sword, with hunger, with death, and by the beasts of the earth. The population of the world is roughly 8 billion meaning 2 billion people will die during this time. The remaining 17 judgments of God include devastating earthquakes, cosmic disturbances, scorching heat, meteors, 100-pound hailstones, volcanic eruptions, loathsome sores on those who take the mark of the beast, the seas, rivers, and springs of water turn to blood, demons torturing mankind, and a 200 million strong demonic army who will kill another third of mankind, bringing the total to 4 billion. The signs of Jesus' soon return are so strong now, and the evidence is so clear that any person willing to accept the truth can see that the end of the world as we know it is near. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, but God demonstrates His own love toward us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. These are the ABCs of salvation. A. Admit that you're a sinner. B. Believe in your heart that Jesus Christ died for your sins, was buried, and God raised him from the dead. C. Call upon the name of the Lord, and you will be saved. Jesus paid the price for mankind's sin. He has provided a way to spend eternity with Him and the Father. All you have to do is believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. God has already done all the work. All you must do is receive, in faith, the salvation God offers. Fully trust in Jesus alone as the payment for your sins. Believe in Him and you will not perish. God is offering you salvation as a gift. All you have to do is accept it. Jesus is the only way of salvation. That being said, we must repent of our sins. While repentance is not a work that earns salvation, repentance unto salvation does result in works. It is impossible to truly and fully change your mind without that causing a change in action. In the Bible, repentance results in a change in behavior. Repentance, properly defined, is necessary for salvation. One day, Jesus is coming. You may be at church, you may be at work, you may be asleep, God grant that you will be ready when he makes his personal appearance. My God, what if his appearance occurs on a Sunday morning? Time is short. Call upon the name of Jesus today.